The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Wendy Davis, Assistant Executive Director of CJJA. Today's webinar is the first of a two-part series hosted by CJJA in partnership with the American Institute for Research. This webinar series is supported through funding from OJJDP. Today's webinar focuses on emergency and pandemic planning in juvenile facilities. I would like to thank all of you for taking time to participate in this webinar today. And special thanks to Simone Gonsolin, Principal Researcher at AIR, who's put a great deal of work into the preparation of this webinar, as well as our presenters, who I'll introduce shortly. For those of you who might be new to CJJA, we are a national nonprofit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, programs, and most importantly, long-term outcomes for youth and their families. CJJA represents the state juvenile justice system CEOs throughout the United States in various local jurisdictions across the country. And now to introduce today's panelists. We are pleased to welcome, of course, Simone Gonsolin, the Principal Researcher for AIR, where he serves as the Director for the National Technical Assistance Center for the Education of Children and Youth Who Are Neglected or Delinquent. Tyrone Oliver, Commissioner of Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. Dr. Michelle Stapleshorn, the Medical Director for Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. We also have Kenneth Appleberry, the Director of Rockdale Regional Youth Detention Center, which is also part of Georgia DJJ. And we have Kanja White, Director of the Metro Regional Detention Center, also with Georgia DJJ. All of today's presenters have direct experience in responding to juvenile facility emergencies, and more recently with the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate them for taking time to be with us today and look forward to their presentations. You can find their full bios in the handout section located on the right side of the screen. At this point, I'm gonna ask Charity Brinstall to provide us with a few technical instructions before we start. Charity? Good afternoon, everyone. If you could please use the audio through your phone and use your PIN number. Everyone will be muted during the uh, webinar. Please use the question box to type questions in at any time. They will be answered during the Q&A portion of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. A link to the audio recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent following the webinar. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Simone Gonsolin. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wendy and Charity, appreciate that. And it's good to have uh, so many people on, on today's webinar. Uh, what I want to do is take a couple of minutes to review the uh, learning objectives for this webinar. Uh, first of all, is to determine the primary goals of effective emergency planning, which of course would be inclusive of a pandemic, as, as Wendy said a little earlier. Share the overarching tips for emergency planning, uh, identify essential functions for your facility, and, and we'll really talk about why that's so critically important. And you see that in the Georgia DJJ plan uh, that, that the commissioner uh, is gonna be going over in a few minutes and his staff. Also review the key components of pandemic planning and learn facility uh, specific strategies from the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of give a quick overview of emergency planning in general, which kind of have a 10,000 foot uh, perspective, uh, whether the emergency is a fire, a flood, hurricane, a pandemic, you know, whatever it might be, these are some of the basics. Then the Georgia DJJ will look um, specifically at their pandemic plan that is uh, a component of their larger emergency plan for their system. Uh, they'll drill down to more specific details uh, that uh, I'm sure you will find extremely helpful given today's uh, situation and given today's topic for this webinar. Okay, next slide. So the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention uh, and FEMA uh, commissioned a guide. This is a, just the cover of the guide uh, that uh, we will base a lot of our information that we share with you today on, on the framework uh, found in this guide. And you can just Google emergency planning for juvenile justice facilities and it will come up uh, and you'll be able to take a look at this guide. This guide was uh, uh, recommended by the National Commission of Ch on Children and Disasters following some studies done uh, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, and CJJA was involved in those studies. I'll speak to that uh, a little later uh, in, the, uh, in the webinar. Next slide. So we want to really cover, you know, what are the goals 
uh, as far as uh, the importance of planning for your emergency plan. First of all, the efficient uh, continuation of operation during the emergency is what's critically important. So, you know, as you prepare for the emergency, as you're in the throes of the emergency, and then of course, you know, what follows the emergency. Uh, so so that, that's really a critical piece here because we, we're all what, 24 hour, seven day a week operations. So, uh, you know, there's no downtime uh, to say, okay, well, we're gonna regroup here. Uh, we have to really think about how we're gonna have that continuous operation uh, moving forward. Secondly, you want to reduce risk to your physical plant and the functionality. This includes the functionality of your physical plant. Uh, that, that's what's critically important, especially when you think about a pandemic, uh, because of the different configurations that many of our facilities uh, have currently. And then finally, the safety and well-being of your staff. I mean, that's primary, right? You want to make sure that, that the youth that are in your care and your staff is providing those services to, to the youth uh, and for the community are in fact safe uh, and secure. Okay, next slide. The next slide shows uh, the emergency preparedness cycle that was developed by FEMA. And uh, you, you clearly see this cycle and the information that the individuals from DJJ will provide. Uh, you know, you start off with planning, you know, thinking through what are those, what are those um, emergencies that you really need to respond to and think of a plan. You're gonna organize the, the, the equipment, you're gonna organize the facility in order to make sure that you have what's needed to really address your plan. You know, one of the things that you'll find in that juvenile justice guide that we had on the screen just now is that for like a shelter in place or, or where, you know, people are not allowed to come in and out and there could be a disruption in receiving supplies and equipment that you wanna have three gallons of water uh, per child and per adult per day for three days. I mean, that's a lot of water you have to have on hand, right? So those are the things that you want your plan to sort of contemplate based on the recommendations from that particular guide. Then of course, you're gonna train your staff, obviously staff has got to know what to do, right? Those expectations. So, so that's uh, the next step. And then exercising the, the plan is critically important because if you don't exercise it, how are you going to know it's really going to work in the true emergency uh, when the pandemic uh, sh sh should hit? Um, you know, and, and, you know, oftentimes when I've worked with systems in this particular area, they, they kind of back away from the exercise piece because, you know, you think of shelter in place, you know, you could probably do that. You know, you have your fire your drills, you do exercise those, right? But, you know, talking about evacuation, potentially, if you have to evacuate the facility, you know, but, but there are ways that that, that can be done through a mock sort of exercise. Uh, and then finally, once you exercise, you, you want to look at your plan, evaluate it, and determine what sort of improvements are necessary. So the next slide really takes a look at, um, you know, some important tips that are critically important in any uh, emergency operating plan. First, you want to ad adopt an all hazards approach, uh, you know, making sure that pandemics are included in here. I will tell you with many of the, the plans that I have seen, and I've actually helped facilities write, pandemics are typically not addressed. So I, I think, you know, what you're going to hear from DJJ today from Georgia, you know, is truly going to be helpful to those people who may have, you know, a plan for a pandemic, but it may not be, you know, as, as rich as you'd like for it to be or as comprehensive. Um, secondly, uh, collaborate with partners and stakeholders because with many of the emergencies, you really can't do this alone. And pandemic is one of them that you really do have to, you really do have to collaborate with some stakeholders and partners. Establish a chain of command. This is something that we in the juvenile justice system, you know, typically understand and, and we, we typically can uh, take care of this. And I think in many emergency plans that I've seen, this sort of, this particular component is usually well written and thought out uh, very well. Uh, writing, uh, writing a planning document, you know, just pulling together the right team in order to do so. I mean, if you're thinking about a pandemic, you want to make sure that your writing team is inclusive of medical staff, obviously, you know. And then finally, exercise review and revise the plan. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of these tips on the next couple of slides very quickly, just to drill a little deeper. So next slide. First thing we mentioned that all emergency plans should have an all hazards approach. 
to emergency uh, uh, disaster planning. You know, what are the full ranges of emergencies? You know, given your conditions, uh, you know, yes, in fact, you know, you may have issues around fire, earthquakes, hurricanes, flooding, but make sure to include that pandemic. Because as I said a little earlier, the majority of the plans that I have seen or reviewed or critiqued, they, they have not had pandemic covered in there, or it's been covered at a, at a very minor level. Uh, and oftentimes uh, the pandemic statement in there is, we'll contact public health. Well, yes, you should obviously, but you know, public health is not gonna come in and operate your facility, right? So, I mean, you really need to think those sorts, sorts of things through. Utilize the, uh, the vulnerability assessment. This is usually done by the State Emergency Preparedness Office. When I've looked at those, oftentimes pandemics are not included in there. They think more in line with hurricanes, earthquakes, blizzards, you know, those sorts of things. Consider your geographic location. You know, if you're in a metro area, you know, that's given, given COVID-19, that in and of itself is a little different from say a facility in a rural area. Uh, so, so you really wanna consider those things. And then finally your physical plant, uh, you know, given the, the, the format of many of our facilities, you know, dorm styles, open bay, individual rooms, that makes a huge difference, right? In your pandemic planning. Um, are, are you able to isolate youth in any way, shape or form given your physical plant? Do you have a zero pressure area within your infirmary? Uh, to really truly isolate uh, the youth that may in fact have COVID-19. Okay, the next slide uh, covers uh, collaborating with partners and stakeholders. This is sort of a laundry list of potential partners and stakeholders you may wanna consider from, for most emergencies and disasters. I mean, clearly for pandemics, you know, you would want the state emergency management agency and public health to be involved, those two for sure, because they're gonna have recommendations from the CDC, from the governor within the state, or the mayor within that, that particular city or our county official. Obviously, uh, emergency medical services, you wanna make sure that's all in, in, included, inclusive in your, uh, in your plan, uh, in case you do need to actually evacuate a youngster to a hospital for more intensive medical care. Uh, and then of course, human services would be critically important uh, also to, to help with uh, your particular plan and carrying out your plan as well. Uh, so you really wanna find out uh, you know, what human services within your region or state uh, would be doing during this uh, pandemic or any other emergency. All right, next slide. Uh, as I said a little earlier, uh, chain of command, this is something we get pretty well within the juvenile justice uh, arena, but you wanna make sure that you know, in your organizational structure, for, for managing that emergency. You know, if it is a pandemic, you know, typically for the management of an emergency, we think about, you know, the leadership in the facility, the frontline staff, that sort of thing. But when you're thinking about a pandemic, you have got to have a medical person up here in the higher levels of management as far as that organizational structure is concerned. Uh, the uh, standardize your approaches, uh, to the functions of the facility, critically important. You know, your equipment, your procedures, your communication, uh, both internal and external communication. Once again, the medical person needs to be at the table to really assist with this because they know the types of equipments and procedures that need to be put in place. Uh, and then of course, you wanna have a direct tie to the local or state uh, emergency system and, and uh, public health. All right, the next slide really gets to a very, very important piece of, of a tip that we want to share with you today. A very important point, I'm sorry. Uh, it, this is your writing team. Uh, you know, in order to really address uh, your emergency plans, whether it's a pandemic or other things, you want to make sure that you have the right people at the table. When CJJA and OJJDP um, did a study, a review of uh, 45 state emergency uh, plan, uh, emergency plans, they found that they were, they were woefully inadequate. It was mainly sort of a uh, continuity of operation sort of plan. And they found that the stronger ones were ones where there was a team writing the, uh, the, the actual plan. So that broad-based planning team was critically important because it brought in all the needs or addressed all the needs of the facility 
for that continuous operation. So this is something that came out of the study that CJJA assisted OJJDP with. Next slide uh, goes to the final tip that we want to share with you. And, you know, it's sort of a run through of, of uh, several tips that really you, you should engage in as far as your plan is concerned. You want to clarify the plan's directive and procedures. So make it really clear so the staff understands it. Expand the support of the resources required for the safety of youth and staff. So given whatever the disaster is or the emergency or the pandemic, you know, what are additional resources? And DJJ, Georgia DJJ will talk about this. They've done an exceptional job in this particular area. You want to request the assistance of additional community stakeholders, improve the effectiveness of the communication strategy and transportation procedures, a big issue, right, for us in the facilities. Obtain additional forms and document documents that tailored to your setting. So, you know, you think about a pandemic, you think about those sorts of pieces of data you've got to collect in order to really keep uh, good tabs on what's happening with them in the facility that will ultimately help drive some decision making down the lines. You know, what are some of the documentation or forms you will use to, to help you make those decisions, always with a medical professional and get them to write the forms. The medical people know this, right? So, I mean, they can whip this out in no time. Uh, facilitate access to the, the appropriate resources and adjust tools used for coordinating uh, uh, coordination of the planning. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, this is my last slide before I turn things over uh, to Commissioner Oliver, but this is a critical, critical piece. You don't want your plan to be 80 pages long, right? I mean, you, you, you know, you can't overwhelm staff or they're not going to really get what they need to do. You don't want to overwhelm them with a bunch of narrative or verbiage. So what's critically important is for you to identify those critical functions or essential functions in your facility and determine which ones are the most critical by prior prioritizing these particular functions. So, you know, given, think, think of just, you know, what you're all involved in right now with the pandemic, obviously security and safety of the community, the staff and the youth would be an essential function. Nourishment of the, of the youth and, and particularly, potentially your staff that's there. Medical sort of responses would be critical. And then the personal, the personnel exchange, you know, entering and exiting the facility, uh, making sure that you have the appropriate coverage on the floor, uh, and, and within the infirmary or that sort of thing uh, to, in fact, implement your plan. So th those are just four areas. There, there are others, and depending on what the emergency or the event is, you know, it could be a fire, or a pandemic, it could be a hurricane, it could be a flood, you know, this, this sort of piece might change a little, but you don't want to write to everything that goes on in your facility, in your plan. You only want to write to those critical functions that there's no debate have to occur. And then uh, who, who are the required staff given those prioritized functions? So that way, if you can allow some of your staff to remain home at this point to lessen the impact of the disaster or the pandemic, great. They won't be involved in the prioritized functions, but we'll bring them in as we can. And then what are the supporting functions that must be in place really so that these prioritized functions can continue? So think a little deeper than nutrition of staff and youth. You know, what does that take, you know, and what's needed, uh, and, and, you know, such as, you know, a, a storage area for, you know, water and for food and those sorts of things. So this is just sort of a quick overview of emergency planning, uh, 10,000 foot level sort of, sort of approach. And what you're going to hear from Commissioner Oliver and his staff, you're going to hear about how they have taken much, many of these recommendations and have turn them into a, a pandemic plan that is proven to be successful for them. So I'll, think, turn, I'll turn things over to uh, Commissioner Oliver. Thank you, Simon, um, and good afternoon to all. I'm gonna quickly give, just give a brief overview of DJJ as a whole, just to kind of put in the contents of, um, of, our, of our agency as we begin to talk through our pandemic planning. Um, Georgia DJJ has about 3,500 dedicated and hardworking employees that work across the state. We serve about 10,000 youth statewide. We average about 1,000 um, in secure confinement and about 9,000 we serve in the community or residential placements. Um, we operate our own school system statewide and we have 25 facilities 
We have 19 um, short-term detention centers throughout the state and six long-term um, youth development campuses throughout the state. So I just wanted to kind of put that in context as we move through our slides and talk about our pandemic um, planning. So next slide. Start off with a quote from Benjamin um, Franklin, failing, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, and I think that's gonna be very important. And that was one of our um, points when we were going through our pandemic plan is to, is to always remember that. So next slide. So our pandemic planning, um, I think Simon touched on some of this earlier, but identifying a planning team to obtain input from impacted areas. What we did, we put together, um, our executive team got together um, three times a week um, during the during the initial stages of this pandemic, and and we started we started planning early. We started planning early on in March to come up with um, um, things to to um, that we needed to put together as far as our um, pandemic plan, and determine phases of the planning and levels of participation. And I think you said it best. Also, Simon touched on it. As far as you want to you want to have the right people at the table at the right time. I think that was very important for us. Um, earlier on is to bring those people into the table, but phase them at the right time so you don't have so many people there and creating more um, um, chaos that's on top of the pandemic. Anticipate all scenarios that is needed to maintain critical mandated functions. You know, you want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And, and one of the things that we've done here in Georgia is um, we did just that. We had several um, evacuation locations and several um, quarantine locations in case we need it. Knock on wood, um, as of today, we, we hadn't need any of them, but um, we had those uh, measures in place um, just in case. You want to make sure you conduct a policy review to determine any kind of modifications. We had a very good pandemic plan, but as I'm pretty sure as everyone on this on this um, webinar knows, we didn't have a pandemic plan related to COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So we had to review our policies and make some modifications to fit that um, into our into our normal routine. Next slide. Being prepared for the unexpected. Um, this, this, this virus was, uh, was very unexpected, as we all know. Um, so be prepared for staffing shortage, shortages, illness, um, at-risk staff who are unable to work, um, family or caregivers' responsibilities. I, I know a lot of schools, and in, in, especially here in Georgia, we shut down early, and um, and most of the most of, the, of our staff daycare daycares weren't open, schools weren't open, so they had they had to care for their families as well. And staff, um, stress on staff and the anxiety for them. Um, this is a very unknown situation. So make sure you take that into consideration and have some EAP, employee assistance programs available to the staff and, and just passing down information. I think information was is key to just to kind of loading that, um, the load on them as far as their stress and anxiety on what you're doing to um, combat this pandemic and ensuring that they're safe and they can go back home to their families. Teleworking demands on demands on technology. Make sure you have enough laptops, cell phones, internet connections. Um, we started teleworking pretty early, and um, luckily for us, we were able to put some infrastructure in place and have laptops in place and um, Wi-Fi boxes, Wi-Fi connections in place. So we were able to, um, for non-essential staff, for them to continue to telework and still get the job done effectively. And and we're still doing that at, um, even as even today. And we're slowly, we're slowly transitioning back into um, somewhat of a normal operation, but um, that helped us out um, hugely. And physical plant limitations, um, limited supplies, deliveries, outages. As you all know, when this pandemic hit, you couldn't find um, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, um, water, things of that nature. So very early on in our planning stages, we made sure um, as we saw those things start to deplete off the shelves that we had enough supply to, um, to last us a, a, a few months, and so that was that was um, very important. And financial implications, of course, it takes a toll on your budget. Uh, so we worked hard with our CFO office here to um, ensure that we had um, the proper funding to kind of get through it. And then, and so now afterwards, we're still dealing with uh, financial implications as a statewide budget. Um, I know here in Georgia, we're going through um, significant budget cuts. Um, it was a 14%, now it's 11% budget cut statewide. And so you want to make sure that um, you're, going to, you're going to be prepared for that. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Staples Horn, our medical director. Thank you, Commissioner Oliver. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me have the next slide, please. With 
any pandemic planning, uh, there's a pre-pandemic phase that you'd like to prepare for. And we had a part of our, as a part of our infection control policy, we had a pandemic plan in place several years ago. Actually, it was implemented back with H1N1, but it's a larger, it's a part of our larger infection control policy where we deal with respiratory illnesses, skin, uh, all other forms of contagion. So with this COVID-19 pandemic, as we saw that it was looming uh, in the horizon, we started doing some pre-pandemic planning and preparation. We identified key stakeholders such as public health, Department of Education, the families, the courts, and involved those persons in our response plan. Critical to the plan was to determine the essential functions, security, healthcare, food service, education, maintenance and engineering, technology, finance, human resources, emergency management, transportation, training, communication, and on and on and on. The more you think about our essential functions, the more you want to identify those specific niches that you want to address in your planning. And then we developed and practiced our pandemic response plan at multiple levels. I believe we have included our pandemic plan as a resource and you have several phases um, beginning with the pre-pandemic plan phase, moving to when you see the pandemic looming um, on the horizon and then you know that it's imminent or approaching quickly and then when you're in the full-fledged pandemic, which is where we are now. Next slide, please. It is essential that we have teamwork. All partners have to be at the table and we have to work out all of our needs to make certain that all everything is addressed. And I mentioned a lot of those um, partners in the previous slide. And we want to certainly make sure that all the voices are heard when we develop this plan. And we want to see if it's feasible. And if it's not, it's no need in having it written in the plan because you can't implement it. So we worked on that. Also, flexibility is critical. We had a plan A, we had a plan B, we're now down to plan C, and you have to have the flexibility with your pandemic planning because particularly for COVID-19, we have seen that that pandemic changes almost on a daily basis with regards to symptoms and testing and isolation requirements. So you have to have flexibility in how you're managing your plan. Next slide, please. During the early phases of the pandemic planning, when you know that that pandemic is imminent, you want to develop a tracking and reporting system for the disease. Determine your staffing contingency plan and cross-train staff because we don't know in the early phases well, the half the facility may be out. Would we have individuals there that were trained to be able to prepare food? So we talked about how persons that may have other duties in the facility may have to take on other responsibilities if there are many other staff out. As the commissioner mentioned, securing additional supplies and equipment and having those on hand was critical. Those budget implications, uh, we're happy that we purchased a lot of the supplies and the things that we needed in advance of the budget cuts, but you have to make certain that you are aware of that possibility. We want to determine the means of accurate dissemination of information and education. Have an education plan in place that you can disseminate not only to youth, but to the staff as well because people get information from a lot of resources that may not be um, as accurate as we would like for them to be. So make sure that you have an easy access for them to get the information on your pandemic plan and how it's impacting them and the facility. You want to determine the immunization and health status of youth and staff because if you have immunocompromised staff, you may need to identify those individuals and, and do keep in mind you have to maintain the HIPAA required privacy for those individuals, but you do need to accommodate them in a time of a pandemic where they may be more at risk 
for uh, getting the disease and maybe a more severe disease. And the same thing with youth, identifying those that are severe asthmatics or maybe immunocompromised in the facility and being able to, at least if you cannot get those youth released, to be able to closely monitor those individuals by medical staff. And then finally to uh, initiate containment procedures and identify, well, if you have a huge pandemic with lots of youth involved, do you need to identify um, a full facility that you can quarantine or do you need to identify certain units based on the physical plan of the building? And that all needs to be done in advance. Next slide, please. You cannot always depend on the community response. However, we, we love our community partners, but keep in mind, they're in the midst of the pandemic as well. So their resources may be stretched as much as yours. And so it behooves you to make contacts and communicate with them prior to the pandemic, because those initial collaborations and contacts are much more difficult to establish during a crisis. So you want to make sure you have all of your public health partners and other stakeholders in place, hospital contacts. For example, the hospital that you routinely use may be in one of the hot spots or a greater area of pandemic prevalence, and you may not be able to utilize that hospital. You may have to look at an alternative location if you need to hospitalize the youth. Or you may have um, public health that may not be able to come out and provide testing for you that you have to manage to get your staff tested otherwise. Next slide. And do keep in mind, although we are in the midst of a pandemic and we need to continue to collaborate with state, regional and federal partners for support and resources, that does not uh, negate the fact that you're going to have these other emergencies occurring. Um, uh, Commissioner and I were um, sort of um, uh, talking the other day because we've had so many. Um, we've got a hurricane, we've had uh, tornadoes, we've had the COVID-19, we even had a case of chickenpox uh, at the facility. So those things, even though you're in the midst of the pandemic, you still have to plan for other natural disasters and how you're going to manage that in the face of COVID-19. And you have to uh, account for man-made events such as fires, riots, or power outages that you may have to address during the midst of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So here we are in our current pandemic, and this is a shot of correctional officers back in the 1918 uh, pandemic that hit us um, about 100 years ago. And I think it's always important to learn from history and look at some of the things that may have been done then and look at how we can do them better now. So we want to update policy and issue new directives to address the current pandemic. You may have had some things in place, but you may have to have some modifications with regards to, for example, staff reporting to work uh, and how that's managed. We have to implement social distancing through teleworking and other reduction of non-essential uh, visits. We have to stress adequate hand washing and disinfection measures, extend and expand computer and telecommunication resources, limit transport and transfer of youth, and implement intensive cleaning and disinfecting schedules at the facility level. And now as we start to reopen for central office, we're doing that in our offices as well. Next slide. So some of the considerations for pandemic um, planning, of course you need a screening process for staff and youth that you can screen and also report because if staff are not able to report to work, they need to have a chain, a clear chain of command to identify, um, to respond to those individuals and let them know they're unable to report because of illness and symptoms. And that we have um, at the entrance to our central office as well as the facilities, we have thermometer checks as well as screening questions that are being done both for staff and youth. 
you need to have staffing contingency plans, uh, such as the use of overtime and the leave designation, so work closely with our HR department. As I mentioned earlier, there are other respiratory illnesses and things that sort of come along routinely, such as influenza. So it's important to know the immunization status of your youth and for your uh, staff. Fortunately, when we had the chickenpox exposure, we were able to pull the uh, vaccination records of all the youth and identified that they had indeed all been previously vaccinated um, and did not have to be concerned about that exposure. You also have to consider the medically fragile, both youth and staff. Uh, check your facility inventories of appropriate disinfectant agencies, and don't forget security concerns with regards to youth having access to those and possibly ingesting those agents. So as we put more out and utilize them more, you have to make certain that the youth don't have access to them. Again, identify facility housing locations for isolation, certain ventilation needs. One thing that we were able to do, I had concerns about ventilation since we were somewhat a closed system. When we did do testing for COVID-19, I had the medical staff to take the youth outside to do it because that's your best place of ventilation. Um, if the youth is spewing out uh, droplets, uh, they're much easier to be dispersed outside than inside the facility. You need to have plans for providing services to youth if they're medically isolated. And um, the directors from the facilities that we have on the call will talk more about that at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. We had a uh, restriction of, um, of visitors um, and there are way ways to do this with parents, we were able to utilize telecommunications and actually increase the amount of visitation that was occurring versus physical uh, visitation. We updated our agency website and we do this regularly, at least every week to include easier uh, access to information. We have YouTube videos. We have a lot of things available for staff uh, to be able to access on that website. The availability and distribution of PPE has been major. Um, we have worked on that very early on and have been able to be successful in providing those to staff. And then finally, determination or discontinuation of in-person meetings and even training, uh, like for example, post training, how you want to manage uh, given that temporary interruption of that training and how you might be able to manage more online training. Next slide, please. So some of the methods that we went toward for internal communications were these team meetings that Commissioner Oliver mentioned earlier, where at one point we were meeting, the executive team was meeting at least three times a week. Uh, we did teleconferences, um, daily spreadsheets were done to tell us which, which persons were out or which youth were out, what county they belonged to, um, what day they were exposed, what their test results were done, the test re um, results, whether were negative or positive, the date that they returned to work. All of that is placed on a daily spreadsheet where we can keep up with the community staff, the community youth, the facility staff, and the facility youth. And that's really critical that you keep your eye on what's going on in your locations and that information is shared with the executive team and HR has a part in managing that as well. We did informational videos and I believe there are some links to those where we talk about prevention measures to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the facility. As I mentioned earlier, the website information updates with the links to adequate information. And then signage and buildings as we've moved forward in opening, reopening central office, we have signage in the buildings to make it unidirectional, uh, where for example, the entrance to the building is one way in and we have the exit um, back at the uh, back exit and signage to say which direction the um, person should flow. So we reduce the risk of individuals bumping into each other and um, having more uh, opportunity to spread the infection. And then finally, we have continued to do policy and directive updates 
forms with regards to screening questions, all of those are almost in a continuous um, um, revision mode as we get additional information. Next slide, please. So external communication, and as all of you know, we as juvenile justice agencies are always um, sometimes wary of the press. Uh, we may not always get the most positive press. So it's important for us to see them as partners and communicate with them and give them the information that they seek rather than um, having them pressure you or, or even print something that may not even be accurate. So we provide press releases to the, to the media through our public information officer. We have social media um, involvement for the agency. We do YouTube videos. We have a COVID-19 hotline. And we have video conferencing for legal matters and case management for youth in the facility, as well as video conferencing for parents and guardians when in-person visitation is being prohibited. And we're able to use FaceTime, Skype, some of the other um, methods of communication. And the interesting thing and the positive measure that has occurred in the face of COVID-19 is that we have discovered that youth get more contact with parents utilizing these methods than they did when we were having in-person visitation. They're able to see, you know, grandma and look at their room and, and do a lot more using Skype and FaceTime. And we've actually gotten more participation from parents utilizing those methods due to particular the transportation issues in Georgia, we're you know, sort of spread out and some of our facilities are in more rural locations. And it makes it difficult for parents to actually physically get out and see their youth. And so this has been very productive and we will continue to um, allow video conferencing even once we open up for in-person visitation. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, actual COVID-19 uh, pandemic facts. And I know you've heard a lot of this, but I wanna try to make certain that you've got the most current information. And I'll talk a little bit about testing too, cause that can be a little bit confusing as well. Well, the COVID-19 virus is a newly identified coronavirus. That's the family of viruses. And it's in the same family as the common cold virus, which sometimes in testing you get some what they call cross reactivity. And you may be picking up um, positivity from some of those other coronaviruses. It gets to be very, very technical, but know that that family of viruses has been around a very long time, but we've most recently identified the COVID-19. We do know that it's spread primarily through respiratory methods. And initially we thought only larger droplets. However, some of the research now has mentioned that there may be aerosols, which are basically smaller, finer uh, pockets of um, moisture that comes from the lung. And the difference being if it's a droplet, it's fatter and heavier and can drop to the ground after it comes out of your mouth versus an aerosol, which may spread further because it's lighter. And so that has implications on how the virus can spread. Symptoms initially included fever, cough, and shortness of breath. However, the symptoms list has continued to be expanded. And you've heard everything from loss of smell, loss of taste, congestion, sore throat, um, on and on. Basically any symptom, um, GI symptoms, diarrhea, upset stomach, Almost a laundry list of every symptom um, for, and, and now most recently with young people, rash as post-exposure symptoms. Individuals with pre-existing chronic illnesses and decreased immune response, and those of us that are older age are at increased risk of poor outcomes if we get infected, including death. There is no vaccine or cure yet, most reliable vaccines usually take years to develop. However, I'm still optimi optimistic that we'll be able to get a vaccine sooner versus later for COVID-19. Many people will become infected. Some will have severe symptoms. 
and a minority with severe illness will die, as you've seen from the statistics. So the, the biggest thing that we can do is to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And so that reduces the risk of illness and death. And I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. There are other respiratory infections such as influenza and the common cold coronavirus that are still around. So the best strategy for preventing this contagion of not only coronavirus, but flu and common cold, et cetera, is to stay home when you're ill, avoid people who are sick, cover sneezes and cough, and effectively wash your hands. And finally, please get information from reliable sources. I know everybody wants to be on the internet, but make sure you use reliable sources for information and details about the infection and epidemiology of the disease. Um, it's ever changing. So look at a reputable source and we have some of those resources at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So during the current pandemic, you want to implement implement intake screening procedures for staff and youth. We have gone to requiring cloth masks on everyone, youth and staff inside the facilities. Remember we talked about people may not have symptoms and we don't know whether it goes out in droplets or aerosols. It's, it's much easier to prevent the spread by having a cloth face mask to prevent spewing out of the infection and that cloth mask can be washed and reused. We have prohibited in-person visitation unless it's directly related to services to you to try to cut down on the amount of community contact that you have because if you think about it, all the spread of the pandemic is going to come from the community. So that's either youth being brought in for intake or staff as they come and go and are exposed to the community family members and friends in the community that could possibly bring it back into the facility. You need to provide personal protective equipment beyond just a cloth mask for your healthcare staff and your security staff that are in direct contact with an infected youth. And that would be your cloth, I mean, sorry, your surgical mask, your uh, N95s, your face shields, your cloth gowns and gloves as well. And finally, you want to determine quarantine locations and procedures for implementation if you need to quarantine, say for example, an entire unit. Next slide, please. So we wanted to, and we did discontinue congregate meetings, uh, like board meetings, uh, training sessions. We had a school classroom suspension. As the commissioner mentioned, we are a school district. And so we have schoolroom classes in each facility, but what we went to were uh, packets of educational materials that were distributed to you to um, do on the unit. And we were able to successfully provide education to them on the unit without bringing them into classes. We're looking at reinitiating classrooms in the next week or so and we have plans to do that by looking at spacing youth out further sanitizing disinfecting not sharing uh, equipment etc so those things need to be considered if you are going back to a classroom or congregate setting we are able to feed on the units usually uh, using disposables um, if there is an infection going on or we can have groups eat in small unit, small groups in the dining hall with spacing, uh, social distancing to keep them separate. And then if we, the, I mentioned here about alternate meals. Uh, remember, we may have to use some of those staffing contingency plans. And what we found out is, what, what are you gonna do if all the food service staff, for example, are out ill? So we came up with a meal, alternate meal plan that is much easier to execute than the full meal plans that our dietitians put in place for the regular food service staff. So they were able to put these alternate meals together that maybe involve more canned goods. Um, we were able to um, give them a little, um, like a, um, a tidbit, a sheet on sanitation because they may not be the people that are usually preparing the food. So we had that as a part of our uh, consideration and included in the pandemic planning. 
I mentioned earlier about the teleconferencing for parents and youth. And then finally, the, the, we talk a lot about physical health, but there is a true behavioral health component to COVID-19 pandemic as well. It invokes a lot of anxiety and stress for the staff and for the youth. And we have done educational sessions with the youth. We've provided um, psychological um, and counseling access to them for any anxiety related to COVID-19. And then finally, for your employees, we have the availability of the Employee Assistance Program to be able to offer counseling for them to relieve any stress and anxiety related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what are the healthcare implications? There are a lot of things involved with regards to healthcare and I won't get into a lot of details here, but the screening that occurs at your intake, you probably already had some type of routine screening involved. And so that needs to be updated or either have an additional um, screening tool to utilize to check for COVID-19 symptoms. And again, as I mentioned earlier, those symptoms seem to be ever growing. So you need to be able to update those and check temperatures prior to entry and exit. We actually, when the youth come in, we are um, putting masks on them and isolating them until the medical staff can interview them and, and do an assessment because we are not um, staffed medically 24 hours a day. So when youth come in and the correctional officers who have been trained to screen by the nursing staff do an initial screen, they place the youth in medical isolation until the nurse can see them, which is usually um, within uh, 10 to 12 hours at most. We are screening healthcare staff and excluding them as well if they're symptomatic. We are, we decided to, oh, I decided to continue to rec care services for youth. Some organizations, some agencies have decided not to do things such as routine physical examinations and dental examinations. However, um, with such a large number of youth in our facilities, and, and I felt I really needed to know the health status of those children when they came in. So we have continued to do physical exams and dental exams to know the health status of those young people. What we have eliminated uh, or put on hold temporarily is dental um, prophylaxis and, and dental cleanings and dental procedures that require drilling and spewing of particles uh, and aerosolization of particles and that we've placed on hold. We've also discontinued non-urgent outside appointments and, and also transfers between facilities unless uh, it was absolutely necessary. And those were reviewed by the medical staff and um, placed in conjunction with that outside uh, medical provider to determine whether or not the youth, whether that care can be delayed or not. And so we make those decisions on an individual basis. And we've also looked at quarantine locations and practices that are involved. For example, when counselors need to see youth, they're also provided PPE uh, to see youth that may be uh, possibly infected. We also continue to monitor all of our other infection control practices to make certain that we're not putting ourselves at risk for other infections. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 testing. There are basically two types of tests, and the, the first test is for a current infection. So you may or may not have symptoms, and you may test positive for this type of test. This is a nasal swab test. Uh, there's also testing that can be, be done oral, pharyngeal, or back of the throat, saliva, et cetera. But the, the thing that you need to know about testing is the test is only good for that point of time when you're tested. So in other words, if you test today and you test negative, that's not to say you'll never test positive because you may be exposed to the COVID-19 virus next week and get infected and test positive. So that testing is a point in time test. 
Also, the testing is not 100%, so you can get a false positive or a false negative. So it's not 100%. And the other type of test is to determine whether or not you've had an infection of COVID-19 in the past. Now, again, this is one of those, uh, there are several tests that are out on the market and, and they had an emergency release uh, or emergency waiver of these tests through the Food and Drug Administration. Usually these tests go through uh, very rigorous um, trials before they're released, but due to the pandemic growing so quickly, a lot of the companies got waivers for these tests and so not all tests are created equally and they have different ranges of accuracy and then again even if you do test where you have been exposed to this COVID-19 in the past there is no guarantee of immunity so given all that is to say you have to make a decision in your agency how much and when you're going to test and what what are you going to do with that results because the, the availability of the test will have some determination of how many kids you test when you test etc and what type of test and not only the testing availability but what's the turnaround for the results if your results are going to turn around in two weeks then the quarantine period will be over in two weeks anyway and we're not recommending any retesting. So you may want to consider in that circumstance not to test, to only medically isolate. Next slide. So what we can do, what can we do? You know, we, we, we're not sure about testing. Uh, we don't know who really has the disease or not. So what I have come up with is pushing toward face coverings for prevention. Now, any type of face covering is better than none. Of course, um, there are several types. You've got the regular cloth mask that basically is gonna prevent your, the infection that you may have, that you may not have, know that you have, being spread out to others and to the environment. Because if you sneeze, cough, or talk, then if you uh, have a, a lung infection and it spews out, it can go on a surface and live for days or it can go to another person and get infected. Now, the use of a cloth mask will prevent that infection from spreading out to others. The use of a surgical mask will also prevent you from spreading out to the others. Only an N95 mask will keep the infection from getting into you. And that's why it's so important for individuals that are working in hospital settings with COVID positive patients on respirators at a higher risk to really have those N95 masks. And so if you're wearing a mask, you're really keeping the COVID-19 infection from others, whether or not you have symptoms or not. Next slide. Next slide, please. In addition to wearing a mask or face covering, washing your hand, adequate hand washing is best. And if you don't have access right then to soap and water, then use of hand sanitizer is the next best thing. We need to really look at the epidemiology or how this infection is spread. First of all, the person has to have the infection in their lung. And then they have to get it out by coughing, sneezing, or talking. And then it has to get inside your body in order for you to get infected. And the way that it goes into your body is either through your mouth, nose, or eyes, or you can touch a surface that is infected with the COVID-19 droplets and then place your hands in your mouth, nose, or eyes and spread it that way. So several things have to occur in order for you to actually get infected. So keeping your hands away from your mouth, nose, and eyes is critical and, and washing your hands certainly before you contact those surfaces. And also before you do things like eating a meal where you're transferring um, potentially um, COVID-19 into your mouth. So washing your hands and adequately washing your hands for 20 full 20 seconds is important 
in order to keep the spread of COVID-19 or to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Next slide, please. And then also disinfecting and, and sanitizing. Now, make sure you clean. Uh, some people get uh, into just sanitizing, but it's important for you to clean the surface first and then sanitize. That's much more effective than just trying to sanitize the surface. And as you sanitize your facility, remember those high touch areas like time clocks. In fact, well, we've, we've discontinued the use of our time clock in central office because there was so much contact involved uh, and are using alternate methods to clock in. But things like computers, door handles, et cetera. And don't forget about your transportation vehicles and your carpool shared rides because those can be contaminated as well. And you need to have a system in place that those can be decontaminated and also include logs to be able to show the documentation that has been done prior to the next person using um, that vehicle. In our transportation vans, we do have the plexiglass to separate the youth from um, the drivers, but we also try to limit the number of youth that are being transported at one time. And then finally, if you um, have a COVID-19 outbreak or um, uh, several people or, or, or you've had an active case, you want to be able to have a higher level of disinfectant, uh, disinfection at the facility if needed and have those resources in place. Next slide. And then social distancing. This is a tough one in a correctional facility because we know that, you know, it's very, very difficult to maintain a distance of six feet apart for less than 10 minutes um, that the CDC has recommended. It's not always practical in our setting, but we can do things that we can do. For example, the group movement, we can have distancing there or either do single movement. We can avoid and, and discontinue contact sports for recreation and consider other means of recreation. I love to uh, promote yoga, uh, which can be spaced out and uh, can be quite strenuous uh, as far as a recreation activity. Seating separately in classes, the dining hall and on the unit, um, video games from a distance, coloring books for youth on medical isolation, and then always remember that you need to make certain that services for youth uh, are continued with the use of personal protective equipment and physical distancing. So just because they're on medical isolation does not mean that they cannot be seen by a counselor, that they cannot recreate, but we have to make certain that there are ways to do that. Next slide. And finally, we have a public health responsibility to report positive cases to public health. Generally, um, depending on your state, uh, if you've not already done so, you need to determine where your facility sits, in which county, in which health district, because every district now has epidemiologists that want to do what we call contact tracing or following up on people that are positive and who they've been in contact with. And we can assist in that by providing names, phone numbers, counties of residence. We have, um, when we have cases, we contact the public health department that's in that county where the facility sits. And they generally, if that person is outside the county or that youth is outside the county, then they make the contacts to the other counties as well. Certainly adhere to CDC guidelines for quarantining of positives. There's also a very good uh, reference from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, BOP.gov. That's another resource for how you manage COVID-19 in correctional establishments. And you should also screen youth prior to being released home or being sent to residential placements because you don't want to spread um, infection uh, from your facility out into the community, as well as not wanting infection from the community to come into your facility. Screening and limiting transportation uh, and transports. And finally, know your community hotspots of infection, because you may want to have more resources in an area where you have 
a county that has more COVID-19 cases, or you may want to test kids there more than in an area that may not have as many cases. So it's important for you to know your hot spots in the community and keep in touch because that's going to impact your facility with regards to staff moving in as well as, or being admitted as well as your staff moving in and out. Next slide. So here are some of the resources um, that we have. Um, the DJJ website is uh, djj.state.ga.us. Uh, and um, we have some, um, some video YouTube linkages as well as some other uh, resources on our website. And so I'd like to now go to the next slide. where the rubber really meets the road, uh, where we're looking at secure facilities and how we've really managed this uh, in the secure detention facilities. And I have two directors that have most graciously agreed to um, be a part of this presentation where they've actually had to manage um, youth with COVID-19 infection. I have, um, uh, Director uh, Ken Appleberry and Director Tanja White from two facilities. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask them two questions and I'm going to put the both questions together and they can respond to them jointly. And I will start out with uh, the first question is, how has the current COVID-19 pandemic affected your facility staffing and operations? And then the second part of the question is, how have you been able to effectively manage youth in medical isolation? So I will have comments initially from uh, Director Appleberry, and then we'll have Director White comment. Director Appleberry. Thank you, Ms. Staplehorn. Um, good afternoon, well, good evening to everyone. Um, I wanna thank everybody for having me. Um, it was, it was, it's a great experience. Um, to answer the first question, I do wanna take time to thank the, um, Commissioner Oliver and the executive team, as well as Ms. Staplehorn, because without them providing us the information and the uh, guidance to uh, doing this, this pandemic for the facilities, it's been, it, it's been very grateful um, that they were able to disseminate that information to us, so provided for the staff here at uh, Rockdale RYDC. Um, at the same time, in regards to our staffing, we, we, didn't, we were fortunate not to have that much issue with the staffing, but there were concerns and fears in regards to the issue of the, of the pandemic. But with the information provided to us, we was able to communicate that information with the staff, as well as try to, um, with those staff that have families on outside and, and kids out of school, like Mr. Mr. Oliver um, stated earlier, we was able to kind of allow them or either have them leave early or take certain days off to make sure their families are, are, are taken care of. However, with the, with the young men, in regards to the social distancing and um, sanitation and wearing of the mask and things of that nature, what we did here at Rockdale, um, and, and thankful for the team that's here, is that we kind of separated the groups. And with social distancing, thankful for the, the uh, department, because normally we're a 52 bed male facility. So we, we average about 51, 50, uh, 52 kids. But recently during the pandemic, we was able to keep the average to about 34, which helped us with the COVID-19 process and social distancing. So we was able to separate everybody by units. Um, here, we kind of did the odds and even process in which uh, we went by by unit, by room, room numbers um, of the kids. They all have single rooms. So we went by the room numbers of the, of the young men that's here. And kind of on one day, we'll have odds Go out, go walk down to the um, dining hall to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we have the even number stay on the unit where they're full to be brought to them, where they continue to social social distance. Um, and then on the, on the next day, what we did was we kind of switch them up, in which the ones on the unit, the evens, will move up to the dining hall, and the odds will stay on the unit for their lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. As far as recreation, um, we have a great recreational staff here to. Um, help with the social distancing aspect of the kids, not everybody being in the gym or outside the side at the same time. So again, we separated the groups to about five or six. And what we did was try to have activities as far as table tennis, um, 
two on two shootouts, so we don't have that many kids in one area at one time. And that really helped with 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 the um, containment of the, of the virus. And regardless, we did have one individual um, on a unit on on our Alpha unit, which is which is the smallest unit in the building, because we have twelve on Alpha. We have no other two units that have twenty. Um, but here recently, that number was cut cut in half, so it, it helped us tremendously. So with the part, with the aspect of, of the maintaining and containing the virus on the units, every, the programs are as far as the counseling sessions and mental health sessions, medical temperature checks, all that stuff was done on the units. Um, and they that kind of helped us with containing the virus on that unit and preventing from exiting, exiting the unit as far as, but, but they were still allowed to have recreation, um, but, not with other groups so everything was done they were done outside by themselves in smaller groups to uh, continue to contain um it's been very i can't say it's been very i wouldn't say hard but thanks to to the, to the department on providing us the information that we needed it was it was a success and still is a success because we still abide by the, the the cdc guidelines and the department guidelines to ensure that this this virus is is um, contained. Thank you, Director Appleberry. Uh, Director White? Okay, and good afternoon to everyone. First, I do also want to um, share uh, Director Appleberry's sentiments and thank you for allowing me to participate in this uh, timely um, webinar. Um, it has been a learning experience. I um, share those sentiments as well for the staff. So for the first um, part of the question, um, you know, our answer first to give an overview, Metro RYDC is located in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a 200 bed um, facility. We do house male and female juvenile um, youth here. Um, they do have single rooms. So just to give you a kind of overview of how the campus is set up, we have eight housing units and each youth has an individual cell on the housing unit for them, for their sales. Um, just to, um, when they come in, I'm um, part of our COVID-19 protocol here. Um, we are fortunate to have um, a larger intake area with um, uh, rooms there as well. So when you come in for admission, um, our process and our COVID-19 protocol is that they were quarantined in intake, um, assessed by medical, um, once medical um, provided the medical clearance for them to go into population, um, usually that, that quarantine was about 24 hours, and then they would go into pop, the population. Um, our biggest focus here at Metro, um, because of the size of it, the kids were already, um, when the COVID-19 protocols came into place, they were already technically quarantined if you would say because they were in detention so our biggest focus was to ensure um, that um, no one introduced the COVID-19 into the facility so that became kind of the our leadership team our overall focus um, you know of course the uh, other practices were put in place temperature checking from staff um, we were, we did still utilize our time clocks here um, so we had separate zones of staff um, cleaning throughout the day and evening. And one way that we shared that and communicated that um, to the staff is um, emails were sent out by security supervisors um, throughout the day and throughout the evening shifts, um, documenting the sanitation as well as logging the sanitation. And it just gave staff a little bit uh, more assurance that, um, you know, we were following CDC guidelines and then also the um, protocols that were put in place for the agency. And I think that was one of the, um, it was very important for us to do. Uh, masks also became, um, as Dr. Staples Horn uh, mentioned about the cloth masks, cloth masks are now, you know, just part of our um, uniform for the staff as well as the youth. Um, and, you know, that is an important practice um, that we're utilizing here. Um, because interactions with the public were also um, amended, I'll say, um, at the onset of this, like visitation um, was amended, um, court hearings were amended, um, getting the information out and staying in communication with all of those stakeholders was critical um, to us, you know, lessening the anxiety you know, for the youth and as well as the staff. One thing that we did 
um, discuss as a team um, here is to, you know, provide as much normalcy um, for the youth um, as possible throughout, and as well for the staff as well throughout this COVID-19. Um, uh, again, as Dr. Stapleshorn mentioned, this um, type of pandemic was new to everyone. And, you know, there were a lot of unknown factors at the onset. And so going into it, it was just really important for us to still establish some routines for, for the youth. Um, things such as, you know, the educational um, opportunities um, continued. Uh, they did those in their rooms, um, in their individual rooms. Um, we had set times for that. And then as well as we did um, continue with recreation, um, and we did them in smaller groups. Um, some examples of some of the stuff that we were doing, they did do the shootouts. We had sack races and just kind of looked for um, activities that didn't require close distancing, um, if you will. So that was kind of critical for us um, to come up and be, um, be being a larger facility. It was important for us to kind of communicate um, with each other and just come up with some ideas um, on, on how to do that in a still make it fun for the youth. Um, we did still continue to promote um, activities. Now we did find, as Dr. Stapleshorn also mentioned with the vis visitation, um, we realized that the younger generation is a lot more tech savvy um, than you know some other generations. And so we found that the video visitation, you know, was really a welcomed um, event for them as well as the family. Uh, members and stuff like that. And that is actually something we found some things throughout this protocol that we would like to continue um, well after um, and hope, hopefully after the COVID-19 um, dissipates or lessens. Um, so we did find some things that um, the kids enjoy that we want to implement in our um, daily activities with them. Um, and in addition to that, it's important, it was also important for us to make sure um, as far as the staffing, you know, one of the things we talked about here, our staffing at Metro is about approximately 200 plus employees. Um, and so what happens if people stop coming to work? What would happen? Um, so that's what we looked at. We did, um, we had to create some things for staff. We did numerous cookouts um, for staff. We also did a canned food drive because again, as we talk about this, there were a lot of individuals that were impacted with unemployment. Um, we did have, um, that did impact some of our um, employees where they had spouses, other family members who had lost their jobs. So we did things like that. We did a um, large can canned food drive for staff. Um, we did put up a, a kind of vision board where we said life is good and kind of think back to some times before the, the COVID-19 and some of the stresses. And then they were able to bring pictures, whether it been from a wedding or the birth of their child to put on the board in our admin area so they can walk by and remember and kind of lessen the anxiety. Um, as far as the, the second um, question, as far as what we did to, um, to be able to effectively manage the youth that were in medical isolation. Um, the first thing that we did, we had, we held door meetings because of course we all know, um, just like with this webinar, one of the most important things is for people to get information and get information in a timely manner. And that is important for young people, you know, as well. Um, they, they do require information and then they also always have a lot of questions and then we need to be able to appropriately answer them. So we started out with, with the dorm meeting. When we did isolate, um, we had a situation here where we did have to isolate for precautionary um, reasons an entire housing unit. So we, we talked to them, uh, we had the dorm meeting and then we used one housing unit. Again, we have eight housing units, so we were able to use one housing unit um, for the um, for the quarantine of those youth. The Associate Director of Security then implemented that we had four staff that only worked on that unit. So we had one, one staff person for each shift and each rotation. Um, again, that lessened the anxiety for the youth and the staff. Um, it, pro it provided for consistency as far as the sanitation procedures on the unit. 
and then provided consistency for as well as any of the activities, um, counseling services, mental health services, medical services that will come on the unit. And so we had a set procedure um, with that. So we only had four people assigned to that um, unit, counseling, medical, um, uh, recreation and all the programming was brought on the unit to the youth to their individual rooms and of course you know um, all staff are required to wear masks while in the facility in the physical plant so um, everybody that was on the unit um, you know was checked and had math uh, masks on visitation because it was virtual um, the youth were able to still get their visitation on the tablets um, and ironically too um, I um, did a what um, Director Appleberry said that Metro did not see an uh, increase in absenteeism by staff. Um, actually, there was an increase on people coming um, for overtime. Um, and so we did actually see a positive increase in the staffing throughout this um, protocol that we've been in. Um, what, we, what we did here, we just tried to simplify the, the daily activities for the staff and the youth, uh, making sure that, you know, counseling services, medical services, food services, all those things were still done on a, on a scheduled basis. Um, as we were doing pre-COVID-19, they were just augmented and amended a little bit, but they still, the practices still went on and that was um, appropriate. And I do want to take this opportunity to say also, um, lastly, that the communication um, for from our leadership from um, the commissioner's office on down has been awesome um, and very supportive. Um, Dr. Stapleshorn, um, my direct supervisor, the regional administrator, and all the staff that I work with at the facility, the communication was seamless and timely throughout the, the process um, from the initial implementation. And I think overall that, that was the most critical piece um, because again, as I said earlier, when people have information and they get information timely, you know, it just, it, it, um, it, it lessens the level of anxiety um, that, that can, they can form outside of this um, situation. Um, I do. I do appreciate um, all the support that we we received here at Metro uh, from the leadership in the medical department and all the other departments um, that um, shared in this journey with us. And pretty much that's all the um, that's that's pretty much what we did in a nutshell here um, at Metro. Thank you, Director White and Director Appleberry. Um, we also did, I forgot to mention, we provided meals for our staff, free meals for our staff as well. Um, this sort of was a morale booster uh, during the pandemic. Um, I would like to also, as, as the other, my other um, cohorts have done, to thank CJJA and also uh, AIR and OJJDP with the funding to be able to present this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity, and I believe we're now moving into our question and answer session. Thank you. Yes. Hi, this is Stephanie Vetter, the training director for CJJA. Thank you to all the uh, presenters. We have a lot, you've generated a lot of interest and we have a lot of questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, but first and foremost, I've shared the links that have been mentioned. Um, all the resource links have gone out to all the panelists as well as the pandemic preparedness plan. The questions that we have are really directed to the facility um, directors and um, Ken Appleberry, you mentioned that your daily population dropped during the pandemic from about 52 to 34 youth. And the question then for Metro is the same question. Did you see any drop in population based on the pandemic protocols? And then for both facility directors, we have questions about how did you handle youth in medical isolation as far as what kind of mental health services did you provide? Were youth able to engage in programming, education, and special education while in medical isolation? Ms. White, would you like to start? Sure, I can start. The first part as far as um, a de decrease in the population um, 
we didn't we didn't see a decrease in the population. Now, we, what we do in general, I think even prior, and I think Dr. Stapleshorn had mentioned this um, prior to um, you know the COVID-19 protocols. We do uh, because we do serve about six. Um, counties in the surrounding area, we stay in contact with, you know, court workers, probation officers, and those kind of things. So, um, you know, we didn't see a decrease in the admittance of youth during this uh, pandemic that we're currently in. Um, now we do have the checks, as Dr. Stapleshorn mentioned, that, you know, we have a series of questions that the youth are asked and um, the officers asked when they're um, when they bring the youth in, but no, we did not see a decrease. On the other part, as far as the um, services for the youth that are in that were in isolation, again, mental health services, counseling services, medical services. The only change was they went to the youth. Um, medical made multiple rounds throughout the day, the same with counseling services and mental health services. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the youth have an assigned mental health counselor or um, juvenile detention counselor, for example. Um, they met with their youth routinely throughout the day. Um, there are offices on the housing unit, so if, the, um, if they had to put in a communication note or any of that kind of stuff after they meet with the youth, um, they can go ahead and do that on the unit. So they have an office on located on the unit um, to go ahead and put all their notes in or make phone calls on behalf of the youth and those kind of things. That's how they that's how it was handled here. Thank you. How about for Rockdale? Yes, ma'am. We we still was able to provide those services. Um, just like the other units, there wasn't uh, medical isolated as far as education. They were still um able to uh, work on the work packs that were provided by the, by the educational staff. Um, all other uh, programs, just like Ms. Ms. White stated earlier, as far as mental health and uh, counseling services, medical staff, all that, and food service, all that was brought to the units for, for all, all the youth. Thank you. Um, another question for facility directors related to communication between the youth and perhaps their uh, attorneys, uh, probation, parole officers. How did youth interact with um, their attorneys and were you able to provide opportunity for confidential communications and how did you accomplish that? Well, as okay. far as the, go ahead, Ms. White. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. As far as their attorneys and probation officers, they were still able to communicate with them um, either uh, video uh, conferencing or we uh, we did allow the, the attorneys to enter the facility to um, speak with those individuals. Um, they did, they were confidential. Uh, we just had staff members stand outside the door while they visit. So uh, there was not um, hindrance to, to, their, to, to their attorney visits. Um, and at Metro, what we did, we had the tablets um, that we used for visitation. Um, so they use, you know, of course, Zoom is available, Cisco meeting app, um, Duo, um, di there's different um, virtual means, and they were able to use, utilize that for that. Usually for Zoom, what the attorneys would do, I was usually, I was the point of contact for Metro. Um, so they would, you know, email me the Zoom invite and then um, our counseling um, staff who did an excellent job. And then also um, the counseling staff, volunteer resource coordinators, because you have to remember they, you know, volunteers were not allowed to come in. So, and I think Dr. Stapleshorn kind of um, touched on this as well, that you have people working in other, doing other duties because for, for example, the volunteer resource coordinator, there's no volunteer activity. So that person helped and was a liaison for helping to coordinate um, attorney um, meetings, court meetings and whatever, so that it was uh, seamless. Because again, you know, we average probably about 80 youth here um, any given day. So, you know, for court and all those different things is gonna, it usually takes about 
about four or five individuals to assist with coordinating the different um, courts. Um, you know, you have guardian ad litems that have to meet with the youth prior to the court hearings. Um, so they would have a Zoom invite. And actually when we were in this protocol, and thank you again to, you know, the agency leader, leadership, the um, information technology department um, coordinated with myself and our staff here and the, the surrounding courts to get there's um, different room Zoom rooms you can use for a court hearing that are private, and then they can be brought back in. And so they they really did a lot to um, assist us and make sure that you know all of our um, needs were met here throughout this process. And again, it it it, it wasn't a small. Um, even for um, Dr. Stapleshorn, the commissioner's office, I'm sure it was not a small um, feat for them, um, but they worked with us to um, get those things accomplished and make sure it was seamless and that it worked for our stakeholders. Great. Thank you, Ms. White. So all hands on deck in, for in Georgia. That's about, um, it wraps it up for questions. We will follow up with those folks who did not um, get their questions answered um, during this 90-minute webinar. Now I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Thank you, Stephanie. I again want to thank our presenters and all of the participants on today's webinar. But I do want to put out an announcement. Our second and last webinar in this series is tentatively scheduled to be held on Tuesday, July 14th. Now during that webinar, we're going to provide details on the upcoming CJJA and AIR training and technical assistance program to assist juvenile justice facilities on improving their existing emergency operation plans. So webinar registration links, as well as information related to our upcoming request for applications will be sent to you via email. And lastly, there will be a short survey for you to take upon closing out of the application. Please be sure to complete that survey so we can use your feedback to improve on future webinars. Again, thank you all for attending. Have a great day.